You cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. All right, guys, I'm so excited to have Mike Michalowicz here today. Um, I'll be honest, this is the biggest author I've ever had on the podcast. I have read, um, I think, over half of your books. I don't know if it's all wow. of them, but I'm beyond excited to have you. So, Mike, thanks for coming on today. Jim, thank you for having me. You never have an author, quote unquote, bigger than me, and I'll feel like the champion. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I mean, I don't know who's bigger than you. I mean, who wrote the Bible? Oh, pretty much everybody, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, this, this is fun. I have so many questions or not, not enough time with all the books you've read. And I've read a lot of them at the right point in my career. You know, when you get that right book at the right time, um, yeah. you're just like, oh, thank you. It's like when I read the four hour work week when I was 20. Oh, such a good book. And it's like, oh yeah, I needed that. Um, yep. but now I'm married with two kids. I can't pull up the, the nomad <laughs> life off anymore. But, um, so before we even get to the book, you are a prolific writer around one persona and that is entrepreneurs or business owners. Before we yeah. get into all of your content, how did that even get started? Well, cause that's who I am. I've been an entrepreneur my entire adult life, my entire career life, if you will. Um, and have had a lot of successes, uh, which are some, some uncommon and have had magnificent failures, which are somewhat uncommon, um, extraordinary failures, like losing my house and stuff over my business. And uh, from those that journey, I realized um, I don't know much about entrepreneurship. I, I thought I did in the beginning, but I'm like, I gotta learn a lot. So I'm constantly out there curating. Honestly, uh, it's to serve myself. I, I own two businesses. I have four more companies that have licensing my intellectual property. So I'm responsible for six companies and, uh, I need to know this stuff for those businesses. And uh, when I curate it, I'm like, well, it's not just for me. There's a lot of people that will perhaps want to know this stuff. So I write the books to be of service to as many entrepreneurs as possible. I, I love this community. It's a fun one, especially when you're kind of writing for yourself. If you're running six businesses, how do you manage your time and know what to focus on? I mean, I get yeah, yeah. lost in email just being a part of one. How, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm not running. I own six. I don't run any. <laughs> That's probably the key. I, I'm a full-time author. Um, I just happen to have equity in businesses. I, I have a president for each one. Um, and as a result, um, my job is strategy. So I'll meet with the companies and, and sometimes the companies work even collectively. Sometimes they're independent, mostly, mostly independent, but sometimes collectively. And so I'll work with the president or the presidents and, and we'll work on strategy. But then they let me go back, do what I do is, is write about new stuff I'm discovering. I also use these businesses as guinea pigs with the permission of the presence we have here and say, Hey, uh, I got a new idea. Do you mind if we try it out in this business? And when I get a nod, that's uh, something I might include in a future book. That's amazing. Would you, would you say the key to this setup of having this ownership in multiple businesses? Is it finding the right partners, giving them a big enough stake so they have ownership? Cause a lot, like I look at what you're doing is this almost yeah. like micro private equity model. Like, yeah, is, maybe that's a cool term. Um, yes, people must have a stake. I don't know if it actually is ownership in a business. Um, some of the businesses, the presidents have equity. Uh, another one specifically, which is our fastest growing, uh, the president has no equity in the business. Um, but they all do have ownership and ownership is, I think is different. Ownership is where there is a stake in the outcome as they define the outcome. So not everyone's looking for more money necessarily. Some people are looking for personal growth or freedom in their lifestyle or looking to build a resume or whatever. And um, I think my job is to be acutely aware of what every individual is looking to achieve in their own personal life and building their personal CV. And then see if I can align with them the outcome and goals that I've set for the company with their personal goals and work in conjunction. If both can be satisfied, then there's, there's a sense of ownership that, that's serving the company without equity necessarily. And that's really good advice for anyone that's trying to build a team with true owners because I feel like your business is only as the, good as the people that can run it. So that's um, okay. Yeah, it I, totally is. You know, it was a big lesson for me, but I really, 
I always thought if I came out of the office and announced, oh, we're going to do $10 million this year, whatever big hairy goal that was exciting for me, that no one really gave a crap about that. Like that's, oh, that's Mike's goal. That's not the company's goal. Mike gets the new house or car or whatever. But what I started to discover is like everyone has their own individual goals. Um, someone may want to buy their first house or whatever it is, but it's my responsibility to get very intimate with what they are measuring as their own personal accomplishments. There's, there's one, one person who works here. Her name's Amy. She's not an owner in the business. She's, she works uh, as an employee part-time. And when sitting down with her, it was very clear. Amy just wants flexibility. Uh, she doesn't want to work full-time. She likes coming to work for the social aspect and just to get her mind off of home because she has to take care of an elderly parent. And she's like, I just like the break. But she was also, if my mom needs me, I, I got to leave in the midst of work. That's the kind of environment I want. So we structured her role to give her exactly what she wanted. She's like, this is the best job of my life. The, admittedly, the pay ain't great. You can get the pay elsewhere. Um, the, the tasks are not mind-blowingly hard tasks and she's challenged to the highest level. No, she actually wants kind of mind-numbing tasks just so she can kind of disconnect for a little bit. But she's like, I, she says, I've never had a job that's been so satisfying. That was the big aha for me is to align personal vision with, with the corporate vision, which is honestly the personal vision of the owner. That, that makes such sense. You, your people are so important and you can make these small tweaks. It might be small to you, but to them, it's the exact lifestyle that they want. Totally. Whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a brother-in-law that's at this company and they like force him to wear a tie. And all he cares about is like not having to wear a tie. It's like, man, you, you can make this guy so happy if you let him loosen it up. And it's, I, I don't get it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's absurd. Um, well, th that's really cool advice. I have so many questions on, on your, on your business, yeah. but, but honestly, as a person who owns a growth marketing agency, I, I love devouring marketing books. And it's funny, I th in early in my career, I wanted the tactics, I wanted the hacks. And as I go along, I care more about first principle type of thinking. And yeah, yeah, your yeah. book was so refreshing because it got at that. There's a lot of things that really resonated with me. I, I have a few listed here I'd like to hit on. I won't hit yeah. in the intro where you talk about introduction, some introduction, which um, was very, <laughs> very nice. Um, but you mentioned that people won't be different with their business. They won't be different in marketing because they have a fear of standing out and they have a yeah. fear of being judged. That hit me way too hard because I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so true. You're afraid yeah. to put yourself out there. We just started working in public where we share our numbers and I'm terrified because it's like, Hey, here's, here's how we're doing. And then I'm like, how are people going to think about me? Like, Oh, his business is smaller than I thought. It's bigger than I thought. Or, oh, right, right. Yeah, the, the judgment factor. Yeah. And I just, it's funny the the reaction from that's been better than any other content we put out there. And I was reading your book. I was like, this is so true. But as far as why people won't put themselves out there, yeah. like how do you overcome that? Yeah. Great question. You first you overcome it by knowing the necessity to do it. And that alone may not be adequate, but I've been surveying uh, small business owners for the last seven or eight years now with this one specific question of, do you feel you're better than the competition? And I would say almost every business owner says affirmatively a yeah or a hell yeah. And it's the honest truth because in small business, the owner's integrated. So it means they respond faster or they care more. They may not be better in the entirety, but there's certain elements where they are far superior than the alternatives. But if the, client or prospect does not discover you because you're unnoticeable. The client's now experiencing an inferior service. So that's the client's problem, but it's our fault because we didn't market. So the first realization is marketing is the ultimate act of kindness. If you are better, it is only kind to have your clients aware of you because they, they can make an educated decision then what's in their best interest. And shame on us if we're not marketing ourselves. So that's one way to overcome it is realizing it's kindness. The second thing is trying this in small bites. When you do something different to get noticed, there's a devil on our shoulder saying, you're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to get rejected. You're, you're nothing. But the angel's like, it's the ultimate act of kindness. So we want to be noticed without being noticeable. Try a small bite. Just try to put one small thing out there and see what people respond to. The smallest bite, by the way, is you can email your existing clients and ideally some of your past clients you haven't talked to in a while and say, hey, what, what's different about me person or you know, different about our company and look for a common thread. And you'll see like someone will say, you know, you've always just so candid or you're so kind or you're funny, whatever it is, but maybe it's a candid one. 
that's when you realize, oh my gosh, everyone thinks I'm candid. Showing my numbers is, is a form of candor. This is a good thing. And try it and then on a small basis with maybe not the entire world, but with your existing clients and say, hey, do you want to know the numbers? Would that help you? And then when that's received well, try it again. But different is a muscle too, because that fear of rejection will always be there. I still have it. And I've been doing these kind of exercises forever. But once you notice that the people who care notice and the people who uh, make us think about it don't really care, then we start honing in on being of service by being different. And it's such good advice. Like put yourself out there. And you also have a, well, a chapter that you talk about that better is not better. Different is better. Because I think yeah. so, so many times we want to compete. Like we have a razor blade. We don't have four blades. We have five blades. Yeah, you right, know what right. I mean? It's like, right. instead of that, it's like, you don't have to be better. Just be different, but be perfect for this niche. C can you speak to how people should think about being different? What are ways that make you stand out in a way to be different or any examples around that? Oh, well, totally. Yeah. Was, we can talk about shaving the million dollar or uh, the $1 shave club. I think it was called, you know, here's all these companies that are trying to do one more blade. And then one company comes out and says, ah, oh, we're, you know, we got one blade or two blade. And, uh, comes out with one video that is hysterical, but it redefines industry and that sold for a billion dollars to Gillette or whatever. Different is leaning into your natural character, who you are and, and, and dis display it to the world because there are communities who are starving for people like them. These companies that just say, you know, we have one more blade are, are perpetuating the white noise. It's just more noise. And it's like, oh, here's another business that doesn't get me. But when there's this personality behind it, and it, it could be a person with personality or it could be just a business personality, then people start seeing themselves in us. So as an author, I noticed, wow, gosh, authors, as a general rule, very pragmatic, very much like a pundit. You know, they sit up on a, on a pedestal a little bit, not intentionally necessarily, but they're just educating the audience. Like, I know and you don't, and here's what you should know. I'm like, okay, that's not natural to me. And that's also the common noise. So if I do that, I'm invisible. I'm, I'm going to just be real Mike, which admittedly is silly and goofy, um, not far from perfect, and just put it out there. And, and that's who I am. And I started getting this community saying, oh my gosh, I found an author who talks to me like I talk to my friends. Like, I feel comfortable with you. Some people say I'm the biggest tool on the planet. And you know what? <laughs> they're <laughs> they're kind of right. From their perspective, I get it. But for my community, the ones who resonate with it, I'm serving them. So different does also mean rejection, but it often means rejection from the wrong community that you couldn't serve in the first place. And if you did serve them, you'd have to be faking it anyway, which is kind of icky. Yeah. Well, and that is your point of differentiation when I think about it, because you're writing, we'll call it nonfiction business books, but it's not like, you know, I had 20 researchers from Harvard and here's this elaborate case study. It's very right. much meeting that entrepreneur where they're at and using their language. It's very like, fun and easy to read and almost conversational. Um, and thank you. I, you know, I can give you compliments all day. How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> but what you give some good advice to where trying to figure out how to be different. You talk about talk to old clients, talk to current clients, understand that true point of differentiation. Yeah. Once you harness it, it's like, okay, let's put it out there. I am, um, I'm obsessed with frameworks. And so as yeah. I'm going through the book, I'm, I'm interested, okay, what framework do we have? And you have the dad framework. Oh, the um, dad, yeah. Yeah, can you talk through what is that and how can people apply that? Yeah, so it's a, it's three, it's like a checklist. It's the three elements we need in our marketing. Um, what I tried to apply was a concept called Oxum's Razor, which basically says the most simple a solution is, the most likely it's the right solution. And um, by the way, with the dad acronym, it's easy to remember, but I've heard every dad joke on this planet now. The, the framework works like this. For marketing to be effective, it must be noticeable. That's what the first D is. It stands for differentiate. It's that what, what moment. If you ever walk down the street and you're like, what, the what? And you do that, that's something that triggered your mind to pay attention because it was unexpected. There's actually only three ways to get a person's attention. The number one most effective way, but doesn't work in marketing, is threats. If I pull out a gun in front of you, you pay attention. But it causes, also causes a fight or flight response. So you probably snap my nose wide open with a punch to defend yourself. Um, so threat marketing doesn't work so well, but people do it. You ever get something in the mail that says like, you know, $10,000 fine if not opened by the recipient and you got three minutes to open this or you die type of thing. Yeah. 
Um, we get it, but it, it causes a fight mode. We love shredding up that mail and, and just kind of discarding that where we get pissed. The second way is opportunity. Opportunity is known opportunity where someone says, oh, well, that's a value to me. I'm going to grab it. The thing is we can put opportunities out there and people grab it, but they don't stay engaged. Classic example in the mail is you get something with a dollar bill or a $5 bill pasted in. Have you ever got mail like that or coins? Do, do you respond to that or do you peel the money off and put it in your pocket? Most people just take the opportunity and run away. So it's very costly marketing. The third way is different. Different is doing something that's inconsistent with what the customer typically experiences and they have to do that double take. The A in the DAD framework stands for attract. Different for different sake is not the goal here. So it's not being outrageous. It's not wearing the Bozo the Clown costume. If that's not what your consumer base is looking for, they may take a double take, but they're going to reject you. So do something that's noticeable and speaks the language of your market. They say, oh, this is for me. Uh, invokes curiosity or interest or it solves a problem they have or it just entertains. But there has to be a reason to stay engaged. And the last D stands for direct. Once you've made them take notice, they're engaged now, we have to tell them what to do with this. And sadly, this is what one, probably the component that is most missed in marketing is we just send people into this void. Like, oh, thanks for visiting. So what we need to do is tell them what's the next step, step to take. It's a call to action, but it needs to be safe and reasonable. Meaning I can't, you show up to my website because you're looking for cars and I say, hey, give us a $100,000 deposit. We're gonna find your dream car. You'd be like, no way. Conversely, if you come to my site and it just says learn more uh, about cars and you click on that and it says learn more about cars, the whole reason you went to the site in the first place was to learn more. I'm now putting in this circuitous pattern. We try to get, we need to get to a safe and reasonable transaction. Now give me your cell number and we'll send you pictures of the inventory we have on the lot right now so you can hone in on what you want. A safe, reasonable transaction that moves us to the ultimate transaction. No, that, that's really helpful. And I love in the book, you get really tactical on all of this. Um, yeah. And as you go through the dad framework, you had one thing out there around think like a PR person. And it's almost yeah. thinking with that end goal in mind. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think so many times people think they've created the next best thing. They put it out there and it's crickets because they didn't oh. have that mindset. Yeah. So a, a PR technique is human interest stories. You can pitch your local magazine call. You know, I live in a town called Boot, New Jersey. We have the uh, the citizens, I think it's called, that it serves this town, the citizens newspaper. I call them and say, hey, I have a brand new product. Why don't you feature it? And they'd be like, no. But if I said, uh, you know, a townie here in Booton was uh, struggling to, with their business and was collapsing, and overnight they turned around and the town is rallying around them. And oh, by the way, it's because they read my book, Get Different. That becomes a human interest story. It's not about the product or the offer you have. It's about benefits being gained. So if you think of like a PR story, it's not about your thing. It's about how it's changing lives. We humans are really curious about other humans and fun, interesting stories or scary stories or, or just stories in general. And your thing can be part of it, but it shouldn't necessarily be the feature. No, that's, that's so good. And that's such a great way to approach like going to market with anything. Um, so as we kind of wind down, um, I'm going to go a little bit rapid fire, but actually there's a question I, I'm, I'm always interested to ask. I usually say it for the end, but I'm asking it now, you know, you've done so many things in your career. I'm sure like you've helped so many people, but like when you look at your career to date, what's the nicest thing anyone's done for you professionally? Nicest thing anyone's done for me. Um, you know, it was, I remember it was, it was a landlord of mine. Um, this was my first business and we were struggling financially. And I went to him, I was friends, friendly with him. And I said, I, I, I have a rent check for you here. I don't know if I can afford to pay this. Would you be willing to not let me go for one month because I'm really struggling. And he said, I'm going to do the kindest thing I can do for you. And he grabbed the rent check. He said, you got to make money. And it was painful. And it was so the kindest thing he could have done. I realized that a healthy business must be designed to be healthy, not by asking favors and trying to skirt by yet once again. Um, sometimes those painful moments are the best. And that one was a big deal for me. Yeah, it's like they, they want to help you out. But at the end of the day, it's sometimes those hard lessons are the ones you need to go through. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Did, did that then lead to the book Profit First? Was was that a... No, maybe it was in the back. I didn't put that story in, nor did I think about it. No, I had other struggles financially that were even bigger than that. 
But what, what I learned is that, you know, trying to live off of handouts is no way to run a business. And sometimes you can be kind by declining something, even though that person wants it, it doesn't necessarily mean they need it. No, that, that, that's a really good story. Um, and I mean, you've written so many books, so many bestsellers. If I'm an author, I'm launching a book tomorrow. What advice would you give me? What like, you know, I don't want to make you give tactics, but but what would you say to somebody that's looking to write a book and do it at the level you have? Don't launch it tomorrow if, if you don't have a plan going <laughs> in. <laughs> That'd be my tip. Like, I think one thing I didn't appreciate about books is the writing is only about 10% or 20% of the work. And it's freaking hard. When writing a book, I write it to the point where I'm like, this is literally the best of me. I can't go any further. And I put it out there. And that doesn't guarantee community will receive it. Some people say this just sucks. Um, but once it's out there, then you got to market it relentlessly until it gets catches on. It's like starting a fire. The, the, the book is kind of some of the firewood, but until you put a spark under it, it may not light. And if you don't have the billow going, it could go out. So I market relentlessly. Um, so that's what I invite authors to do. If you believe in your book, act accordingly and market it. And, and, and a book is, at least for me is, it has a lifetime commitment. Like, you know, get different quote unquote just came out, but it was seven years of writing, not constant writing, but research and so forth, two years of intense writing. And now it's going to be 10 years of promoting it. Like you're offering me a platform to share it now. This is a form of promotion. I'm going to add it again tomorrow. I'm going to add it again in 10 minutes with another one. It's this relentless push until it catches on. And then maybe it won't, but I have to give it that kind of, you know, billowing of the flame to, to see if it will catch on. Yeah, it's almost like writing is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the the relentless distribution is is the key to it. One thing you've been so smart about is you write a book. It's not just about monetizing the book, but there's a whole component after it, whether it's tools or courses or services yeah. uh, related to that. How important is that to someone as they're thinking through being a full time author? Yeah, so you mentioned four hour work week. Someone who inspired me greatly was Tim Ferriss. When I launched my first book, I met with him. Uh, we were actually on a TV show uh, at the time. We, were, we met in the green room by chance. And I asked him, I said, can you make money selling a book? Everyone at that point told me, you'll never make money as an author. Authors don't make money. You have to do something else. He said, uh, effing yeah, you can make a lot of money as an author. I just released four hours. You know, he, he became a millionaire. He makes millions on the book. So at first it changed my perspective. Um, and I'm in that position where I can live a very comfortable lifestyle off of my book sales, period. But um, I, what I did was I, I have services behind it that I don't run. So those companies, I have a licensee that owns it. Um, and they run it. My responsibility, interestingly, back to that licensee is sell more books because that builds more awareness and they provide services. What I found of any book reader, um, a percentage is the, is the, wants to make sure they're doing it right. A large percentage are the do-it-yourselfers. And that's who I write it for. Just do this, do this. But a small percentage read it and say, it's got to make sure I'm doing it right. And they want the service. It's for those people that these companies uh, exist and serve those folks. That, that's really good advice for everybody to get into that. Um, well, I, I need to apologize to my interim CFO. She had a million questions she wanted me to ask you. Um, but she, she um, loves the pumpkin plan, loves um, Profit First. So last question. Um, you used to play lacrosse in college. You no longer do. Um, can you give us what is your, your greatest sports memory or highlight that, that you want to reflect on? Here's your platform to relive the good oh, days. <laughs> my greatest sports moment. It was so I played for Virginia Tech. Uh, it was my I think it was my senior year. I was the captain of the team and uh, I faced off was one of my things. And we're playing VMI, which is Virginia Military Institute, a secondary school compared to us. And uh, I had a reputation for excellence as facing off. This guy kicked my ass over and over again. And I was like, what is going on here? And I remember sitting on the sideline after getting beat to shit three or four times in a row. I was like, I, I decide not to be beaten again. And at that moment, I won every single face off. I was like, oh my gosh, this is a decision. And that, that served me so well that the outcomes of my life are a result of my active decision making at that's awesome. That sounds like the lacrosse version of Rocky Four with that. <laughs> right, 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 right. That, that, exactly. That it was Apollo. I was playing Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> really? I didn't know he went to VMI. Makes sense. So um, very cool. Well, Mike, thank you so much for the time, man. I've been reading your stuff. This has been really fun. And best of the book. It's really good. I read a lot of marketing books. 
and this one was really well done. So, so thank you so much. Jim, it's been a joy. Thanks for having me.